رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي اللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا اله الا الله اللهم اجعلنا من الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر امين يا رب العالمين The ayat I'm about to share with you and some reflections from them belong to the beginning of Surah Al-Ankabut, the 29th Surah of the Qur'an. It was revealed by most accounts uh, almost at the end of the period of Makkah for the Prophet ﷺ, when the animosity towards the Muslims was so intensified that there were even schemes and plots not only to torture and you know, hurt Muslims, but also kill the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. So things had gotten pretty bad by that point. Uh, and pretty much the only outlet left pretty soon was going to be Hijra, which is an, a migrating from the city of Mecca to the city of Medina. Which is why in this remarkable surah, Allah Azza wa actually gives hints towards Hijra. He doesn't say it directly because it's a covert operation. If he says it directly, then the kuffar are going to know that the Muslims are planning on leaving town and they're going to kill them before they get a chance to leave. So what Allah does in this surah, pretty interestingly, is He first describes uh, for example, uh, you know, uh, one Nuh alayhi salam leaving his people. He's being told to leave by way of the, the, the ark, you know. And then Lut alayhi salam, he says, Inni muhajirun ila rabbi sayahdeen. I'm making hijrah to my Rabb, he's going to guide me. And then by the end of the surah, Allah says, Don't argue with the people of the book except in a better way. Well, the people of the book are not in Mecca. Where are they? They're in Medina. So it's already mentally preparing the Muslims without directly telling them that you're, you know, migrating so that it's exposed to the kuffar also. But they're also being told like things are getting too tough for you now here, it's time for you to move. About the beginning of this surah however, there's a mental preparation for tough times. When Muslims are persecuted, when Muslims are being, you know, uh, not just criticized, but actually becoming targets for no other reason that they're Muslims. In that context, Allah gave these ayat. And Imam Al-Qurtubi, such beautiful words, he said that even though إِذَا كَانَتْ نَزَلَتْ بِهَذَا sabab, even though it came in the context of several Sahaba being tortured and beat up, and they were disheartened because the only reason we're being tortured, and the only reason we're being picked on, and the only reason we're being made fun of in society is because we're Muslim. What, what crime have we done? Why isn't Allah helping us? Why isn't He changing our situation? When some of those people express those kinds of feelings, Allah Azza wa Jal revealed the ayat that I'm about to share with you. But He says, even though they came in that particular event, فَمَوْجُودٌ حُكْمُهَا بَقِيَةُ الدَّهْرِ لِأُمَّةِ مُحَمَّدٍ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ That the, the, the verdict in these ayat and the principles of these ayat are going to live forever for the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa because the, the legacy of this ummah is always going to be that the iman that we have, the gift that we have been given of لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم is not a cheap gift. You don't just get to have it and you don't have to pay its price. So in your personal life, there will be trials and difficulties. And even as an ummah, we're going to suffer trials and difficulties to see how, what pain are we willing to go through to still hold on to this, to still not let go. And that's actually one of the ways we have to understand difficulty in life. Difficulties that Allah gives to the Muslims, to a believer in his life, or to us as nations, entire countries of Muslims going through trial and difficulty, is Allah Azza wa way of saying, seeing who wants to hold on to their iman in the hardest of times. Because in those kinds of times, for people that whose iman can shake, what happens? How did Allah let this happen to me? What did I do to deserve this? I don't want anything to do with Allah. I prayed to Him, I make dua to Him, I worshipped Him, and look at what happened with my family, look at what happened with me. I don't want to pray anymore. And that reaction is actually, that's exactly the test that Allah Azza wa Jal gave. Who is going to hold on to their iman no matter what? And who's going to still remain hopeful with Allah no matter what? Who's going, this is what, why it's called belief in the unseen. It's not just Allah who's in the unseen. Sometimes Allah's mercy is in the unseen. Sometimes Allah's justice is in the unseen. Sometimes Allah's plan is in the unseen. So much of what He does is in the ghayb. What you see in front of you is injustice, it's unfair, it's, you know, it's, it's uh, even, even cruel. And you look at it and you say, how can this be? I can't, I can't appreciate a God who apparently lets, get, you know, lets, uh, lets people get away with all these crimes. But behind the scenes is actually where our real faith is. We don't believe in what we see. We actually, by the very definition, we believe in what we cannot see. We believe in what we don't understand. You know, that's in the hands of Allah, and human beings will never have access to it. وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُطْلِعَكُمْ عَلَى الْغَيْبِ Allah will not be one to inform you what's happening behind the scenes. Allah doesn't owe you an explanation of what's really going on. 
the actual plans. Before I get to these ayat, just to help you understand, we recite Surah Al-Kahf every Friday. And part of Surah Al-Kahf is the story of the journey of Musa alayhi salam at the end of the surah. And in that story, Allah Azza wa Jal describes three different situations which don't make any sense. If you look at it, this, this, these people that are fishermen, they have a boat. This is the only way these young men make money. And you know, Khidr goes there and he just pokes a hole in the boat. And he just destroys the boat. And these people, not, their boat is no good now. They can't make their income anymore. And Musa alayhi salam is like, what did you just do? I came to learn about Allah from you. I was instructed that you're going to bring me closer and you're going around committing crimes. He kills a boy. If that wasn't bad enough, he kills a boy next. And if that, you know, and then later on, finally, he does something good. He builds a wall, but they're starving. And he's like, you, these people don't even host you. They're not even kind. Fine, they're not hospitable people. At least if you did this labor for them in the city, you should get paid for it. So none of these scenarios make sense. And what does Allah do? What's the point of these stories? Even though that's not my khutbah today, the point of those stories is there's the seen world, and then there's a curtain from Allah, and behind the scenes is the unseen plan. Those of you that are from the tech industry, there's the front end of the software, and there's the code in the back end. Right? There's, there's a source code behind it. Okay. Now what Allah does in this surah is He lifts the curtain just a little bit. And He gives Musa alayhi salam a glimpse through Khidr, you know, of things he couldn't bear. He, he saw things that were wrong, he couldn't tolerate them. And he says, I'll explain to you now what was really going on behind the scenes. In other words, that's Allah's way of telling us sometimes we see reality that we don't like, that we think is unfair, that is just absolutely wrong. But we still don't understand that Allah has a plan, that Allah's justice is bigger than what we can see. Now coming to these ayat, they begin with Alif Lam Mim. And I was intrigued by that for a long time because there are many surahs in the Quran that, are, that begin with huruf muqatta'at. Qaf, noon, kaf, haya, ayn, sad, you know, alif, lam, mim, sad, alif, lam, mim, ra, alif, lam, mim, mi, uh, itself, you know, ta, seen, etc., etc. You'll notice that pretty much all of those surahs, with two exceptions, all of those surahs begin with the mention of some, something about the revelation of Allah. Alif Lam Mim, Thalik Al Kitab Ula Rimafi. Alif Lam Mim, Allahu La ilaha illahu al Hayul Qayyum, Nazala Alaik Al Kitab. Taha ma anzalna alayka al kitab ali tashqa. Hamim tanzilum min Allah al Aziz al Hakim. Every time you have these huruf, following the huruf, following these letters that we don't know the meaning of, only Allah knows, Allah says something about His revelations. And the two exceptions are actually Ankabut and Rum. Because here you find Alif Lam Mim, Ahasib al Nas. There's no mention of the book now. And Surah Al Rum, Alif Lam Mim, Ghulibat al Rum. Or, or rather, huruf muqatta'at and ghulibat al-rum. The room was dominated. It's intriguing. Uh, maybe we'll talk about you know, ghulibat al-rum another time. But for now, today I want to share with you what might be one of the benefits that comes from this unique exception in the Qur'an. It may be Allah's way of telling us that the purpose, one of the, one of the main lessons of the book, one of the main teachings of Qur'an itself, is to understand how you're supposed to react when you're in a trial. Like in a sense, you know, the Qur'an has many things. The Qur'an has many, many, many lessons. And it clarifies many, many realities. But if in one sense you were to be asked, what is the essence practically for me? If I was to really internalize the Qur'an, what would that practically mean for me? What it would mean is that I understand that when trials happen, they happen because I have Iman. I have to pay the price of Iman. There are going to be difficulties in my life. There's going to be challenges. There are going to be challenges that come to me at the hands of my loved ones. And it may come, that, that's from the inside. Or within the ummah itself, there will be people that give us problems. And then there will be people from the outside, the enemy that will give us problems. And both of them are, in a sense, Allah testing us the, 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 the grit and the strength of our faith. So what is the statement that Allah makes? أَحَسِبَ النَّاسُ أَنْ يُطْرَكُوا أَنْ يَقُولُوا آمَنَّا Have people assumed that they're just going to be left alone just because they said we've believed? That's the statement. Have people assumed that they will be left alone just because they said that they've believed? وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ And they're not going to be put to the test? They're not going to be thoroughly tested? Interestingly, you could say يُبْتَلَون they will, They'll be tested, but the word used in the ayah is يُفْتَنُونَ And the word يُفْتَنُونَ comes from the uh, Arabic verb فَتَنَا فَتَنَا is used or fitna is used in Arabic originally when you have gold that has impurity. And unlike, you know, if you have clothing that has impurity, you can wash it and the impurity comes off. If you have a, you know, furniture that has an impurity, you can just brush it off. 
But if gold has impurity, you can't just brush it off. You have to melt the gold at very, very high temperatures. You have to burn this gold and put it under excruciating heat, and only then will the impurities come out. That's the only way to purify gold. It's an intense process. So the gold, it's test, its purity is tested by way of very intense heat. And that's when the impurities burn off. The use of that word suggests something. You think you're just going to have faith and you just declared that you're Muslim and you're not going to be put through intense heat? You're not going to be burned like gold is burned? And by the way, in just saying that, Allah's beautiful way of telling us that we are like gold to Him. That the believer is valuable to Him. That you're being put through a hard test because you're just that valuable. You're just that much worth to Allah. You know, sometimes people think because they're going through a hard time, that they're worthless to Allah. Allah doesn't care about me, that's why I'm going through these things. If Allah cared about me, He would have been taking much more care of me. It's the opposite scenario now. It is because you are so valuable to Allah, that you must be cleansed this way. وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ And then Allah says, وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ much before, we tested people before them too. This is the old history of Allah. It's not, you're not the first one to be tested and tried. You're not the first one to be persecuted. You're not the first one to go through a hard time. This has been going on. This is a sunnah of Allah. وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ وَلَا يَعْلَمَنَّ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ صَدَقُوا وَلَا يَعْلَمَنَّ الْكَاذِبِينَ And this is Allah's way of absolutely exposing. This is how Allah will certainly get to see and expose who of you are actually truthful in your claim. Truthful in what claim that they believe? Easy to say, La ilaha illallah. Easy to hold on to it in your heart when hard times come. And that's not, that's not the easy part. And so then he will know who's truly lying. You could still be saying, La ilaha illallah and be lying. You know? This is Allah's way of testing us. I, I chose to mention these ayat, and I'm going to go on, inshaAllah ta'ala, from here too. But I wanted to highlight them for a reason. A lot of us feel the pressure of what's going on in society around us. Some of us... Every few minutes you get a new link to an article about how things are escalating in this way or that way or the other way towards Muslims, towards immigrants or whatever. And the, escala the escalation isn't just in a political sense in this country, but there's a social escalation too. There's a cultural escalation too, right? People may be making comments to your family in the mall now or you know, at workplace people are saying things and harassment cases are happening and all this kind of stuff. And in this environment, it's very easy for people to start thinking, Though, you know, if, if I didn't look so Muslim, or if, he, if I wasn't so visibly Muslim, uh, then maybe I wouldn't have such a hard time, right? And this, this idea, then their families discussing, you know, dad sitting down with the family and discussing, look, I know, I know you've seen me with a beard for many years, but I think it's time to, you know, use some hikmah and just, you know, blend in a little better. And, you know, I know you, you know, if you guys, if you, if you girls, if you, my daughters want to take off the hijab, it's okay. Right now we're in tough times. We don't want to be persecuted, etc. These kinds of conversations are starting to happen, you know. And people are saying, we can't handle it. We, this is too much. And Allah's response to all of that is, oh, what, do you, what did you think? You're not going to be tested. You think people are just going to love you everywhere you go. The most beloved of all people was Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and people absolutely hated him. They hated him. His character is the most beloved character you could possibly have. His smile is infectious. There are people that can't like help but be around him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You know, and this man, rahmatul lil alamin, people absolutely despised him, cursed him with the worst kind of curses. And that's, that's before, by the way, that hatred of the Muslims came way before even we were told any of the instructions that we now make us visibly Muslim. Jilbab hadn't been revealed yet, hijab hadn't been revealed yet, none of these things were revealed. It was just, it was something else that was very offensive about Muslims. They don't budge from their faith. They don't budge from what's true. And they speak out against injustice. That's actually what was offensive to the Meccans. Muslims didn't back off. When, when, a, when an orphan was being pushed around, the Muslims stood up and said, you can't push around the orphan. Quran came around and said, you know, فَذَلِكَ الَّذِي يَدُعُ الْيَتِيمِ When people were being cheated in the marketplace, Quran came out and said, وَيْلُ لِلْمُطَفِّفِينَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا كَالُوا عَلَى النَّاسِ يَسْتَوْفُونَ وَإِذَا كَالُوهُمْ وَزَنُهُمْ يُخْسِرُونَ Quran came out and said, you can't cheat people in business. You can't scam people. You can't push orphans around. You can't be, you know, bury the baby girl alive. Quran started criticizing social evils that were happening in that time. Not, and the victims of it were not Muslims. The victims of it were everybody else. That's what was offensive to them. The Quran doesn't apologize for its message. 
The Quran doesn't hide its message. And its people, once you accept Islam, they'll say, do you believe what the Quran says? Do you believe what, do you, do you endorse these views? And we're like, oh, uh, no, no, not, not, not totally. You know, this is wahum la yuftanun. I've tested Allah says people before and we can tell who tells the truth and who's a liar. We have to stand by the word of Allah. It's the only protection we have. You think standing by the word of Allah is going to put us in trouble? Standing by the word of Allah is the only multahad. وَلَن تَجِدَ مِن دُونِهِ multahada. You will not find any other protection other than the book of Allah. That's the only protection you'll have. Um, then on the flip side, there are those who are giving us, who are persecuting us for no other reason that we believe. You know? What about those people? About them Allah says, أَمْ حَسِبَ الَّذِينَ يَعْبَلُونَ سَيِّئَاتًا يَسْبِقُونَ سَاءَ مَا يَحْكُمُونَ Have those who commit sins assumed that they got ahead of us? You know, سَبَقَهُ actually in the Arabic language is when a criminal is running from a crime and the cops or the authorities or the business owner is trying to chase him but they got away. And Allah says, you think these people who are committing crimes got away from me? You think they're too fast for me to catch? What a horrible decision they've made. And I don't just want to limit this to people who persecute Muslims at a large scale. But I also want you to understand that these ayat have implications in your personal life. There are people that personally have persecuted you, that have tortured you, that have slandered you, that have said horrible things about you. You don't have to make dua against them. You don't. Just know that unless they make tawbah, nobody gets away with it from Allah. You know, your frustration at this time may be, how come this person got away with it? How come they get to say these things and they still every, everything's okay with them? And it burns you inside that the person who hurts you is, you know, chilling. They're just having a good old time. This is a consolation to those who are victims of any kind. Those who commit sins, what do you think, they got away? No, 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 they've made a, they made a horrible decision. Other places in the Qur'an, Allah will describe what a horrible decision that looks like. And I often give the example of it, I won't go into the ayat themselves, but I'll, I'll give you, you know, just the, the, the image of it. I may have described this to you before, if you have a rabid dog or a wild dog, and you tie it up, if you have like a one foot leash, just one foot, the dog can't go more than one foot. But if you give this dog a 200 foot leash, it's a wild dog, it's gonna run as fast as it can, can't it? And for 199 feet, this dog thinks it's free. But when it hits the 200 foot mark at, the full, at full speed, what happens to it? You see? The choke is much stronger. That was actually not a mercy on the dog, that was a tougher punishment. You know? إِنَّمَا نُمِدُّ لَهُمْ لِيَزْدَادُوا إِثْمًا We only extend for them so they can earn more sins. So they can dig their hole deeper. So can, they can suffer more pain. You want to make trouble? Go ahead. Allah will give you license. Make trouble. Dig your own hole deeper. سَاءَ مَا يَحْكُمُونَ then Allah Azza wa turns back to you and me. This is a very powerful lesson, especially for people that are going through a difficult time. A key problem for all of us when we go through a difficult time is that we have expectations from people. We expect, for example, somebody has an abusive father and they say, why can't my father be like every father should be? Somebody says, why can't my, be, my husband be like a husband should be? Why can't my, she's a mother, she's supposed to be kind, why isn't she kind? She's a daughter, she's supposed to be obedient, why isn't she obedient? We always look at people and what they should be, and that makes us angry because they're not what they should be. And we keep getting more and more upset, and we keep saying, this should be different, this should be different, this should be different. By the way, the book of Allah will tell you how people should be. Well, we're human beings. We're human beings. And you cannot turn people into what you want them to be. So they will change when Allah puts that in their heart. You and I can't change people. Even the people closest to us. Even the messenger was told this. You can't even change whoever you love. People come and say, Hey, what can I tell my husband? What can I tell my father? What can I tell my daughter? What can I tell my brother? That can help them change. And the first thing that comes in my head is, You don't just get to guide whoever you love. You can give reminder, فَذَكِرْ إِنْ نَفَعَةِ الذِّكْرَةِ Remind if, if benefit will have, if, if reminder will have benefit, in can here be for tawqeed, and it could be shartiya also. Benefit, there's certainly benefit in reminder, and if the reminder will have any benefit, it's a possibility. 
It's a positive. Our job is just to remind. But the problem is when you put expectations on people and they're disappointed every time, it only burns you more. So what does Allah do in response? He says, "Man kana yarju liqa Allah, fa inna ajal Allah ilaat." Whoever was hopeful, who would they have hope for? Hope with meeting with Allah. Then the meeting with Allah is coming because that's the one that will never disappoint. That's the one that will never disappoint. You look, look, even look at the situation of Quraysh. The Arabs, their biggest, the biggest part of their identity was tribe. Their pride came from their tribe. Their sense of self came from their tribe. Their unity came from their tribe. This was actually at the apex of their identity. But when it came to Islam, the Quraysh are willing to torture even of their own. They're willing to persecute even of their own violating the principles of their own tribe that they would never ever do but they're willing to do it for the Muslims the haram was considered a place that's amin the haram was a place where everybody's safe people used to come from all over Arabia and worship their idols there this is one place that was kept safe and that's one of the reasons the Quraysh were respected that whoever comes there is safe the only people who were not safe at the haram is who? the Muslims the Muslims could stand up and complain, this is against the Quraysh constitution, this is a violation of our civil rights, how can you do this to us? We expect better from you. Uh, you can expect all you want. You can expect all you want. The people who are going to hate the believers just because they are believers have no constitution. They have no code. They have no principles. You can cry civil rights all you want. They're not gonna, those people will do what they'll do. That's, that's the history of, of Islam. That's the history even since the time of Musa alayhi salam. Even since then. Musa alayhi salam was considered one of them. He's actually one of them. And he's, because he was raised as a royal, he was given, granted that royal status under Fir'aun. And eventually even he's willing to bend his own constitution. Musa. Let me kill Musa myself. They don't kill their own, but we'll make the exception for Muslims. We'll make the exception. We have, to be, we have to understand where to put the expectations. I'm not saying we don't struggle for our rights. I'm not saying that. But I, ha I want us to understand, whether it's in our personal lives or as a society, as a society, we need to understand our primary hopes lie with Allah. And if that is gone, then nothing else will matter. مَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا لِقَاءَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّ أَجَلَ اللَّهِ لَآتِ Whoever wanted to be, was hopeful of meeting with Allah, then certainly the meeting of, with Allah is well on its way, and Allah hears everything, knows everything. وَمَنْ jahada, And this is what I want to conclude with, inshaAllah. وَمَنْ جَاهَدَ فَإِنَّمَا يُجَاهِدُ لِنَفْسِهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَغَنِيٌّ عَنِ الْعَالَمِينَ And whoever struggles, whoever, whoever makes efforts, what is efforts doing here? You see, when Muslims are being persecuted, they're on the defensive, aren't they? When we're, being, we're the ones being criticized, critiqued, tortured in Mecca, we're the ones on defense. And Allah is saying, don't worry, those who are persecuting you, I'll deal with them eventually. Don't you worry about that. You just preach what your hopes in me. That's what Allah is telling the Muslims. But by the end of this ayah, what does he say? وَمَنْ جَاهَدَ فَإِنَّمَا يُجَاهِدُ لِنَفْسِهِ Whoever struggles only does so to their own benefit. Struggling is not defense. Struggling is what? It's offense. Allah is saying, in times of persecution, you must stand up for your religion and present it more, with, and more aggressively, more actively than you ever did before. And that's the only way you will survive because you're only doing that for yourself. And you're not doing this for Allah, that Allah will benefit in some way. You're only doing this for yourself. You want to be safe with Allah? You want Allah's protection? You want the angels to come and surround you and nothing to hurt you? Let me see you make struggle for Allah. Let me see you make efforts for Allah. Then the protection comes. And then when, that's what Allah says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَغَنِيٌّ عَلَى الْعَالَمِينَ He doesn't need your struggles. He doesn't need your efforts. He is independent, free of need from all nations and all peoples. He doesn't need the nation and people. You're the ones who need Him. You're the ones who need that struggle. By the end of this passage, Allah has given us the secret. What does it take for an ummah to protect itself in times of persecution? What it takes for them is true struggle for the sake of Allah. Not that they keep taking steps back, but they start taking steps forward. There's a wind blowing in your face, pushing you back, and you're struggling and pushing against that wind. Everybody else wants you to let go of your Islam, and you're holding on to it even more. 
Everybody else wants their, their, their entire symposia and academic circles describing how we want to have a more civil Islam. How we want to have a more, you know, Islam more palatable for the modern world. And here are the passages of the Quran that are problematic. So let's remove those from this course. And in the middle of all of that pressure, we're going to have to be the ones that stand and move forward this way. Right now, we are pushing back. Right now, they make criticisms of the Book of Allah, and we say, yeah, why does the Quran say that? How come it says that? How come it, <laughs> you know, and we start doubting ourselves. This is not how Allah will give protection to this Ummah. When, Allah, when you take a step back, when you start turning your back to the deen, what happens? What happens, Allah says? In tatawallaw, yastabdil qawman ghayrakum, thumma la yakunu amthalakum. If you turn your backs, Allah will replace you with a nation other than yourselves. You are easily replaceable. This is the other meaning of inna Allah la ghaniyun anil alameen. Allah is free of need. He doesn't need any nations. He doesn't need them. He doesn't need the Pakistanis. He doesn't need the Bangladeshi. He doesn't need the Egyptians or the Palestinians. He doesn't need the Saudis. When anybody turns back from Allah's deen, Allah will replace him with somebody else. Next thing you know, the Irish, the Mexicans, somebody else is replaced us. And that's not the first time this happened. This is the sunnah of Allah. He's done it before. He's done it before. This is the time to hold strong. This is the time to show confidence in Islam. This is the time to fear nobody but Allah. When we put our head, this is the last thing I'll share with you. When we put our head down in front of Allah, in fear of Allah, in humility to Allah, you know what that means? That we don't bow before anybody else. That we're not afraid of anybody else. That we're not, we're not going to submit to anybody else. We're not going to feel pressure by anybody else. We don't accept the authority over us of anyone else. Nobody else will bully us. Nobody else will tell us what to do. We don't fear consequences of anybody else. The only fear we have is that of Allah. That's the point of salah. That's the purpose of you standing in front of Allah like that. And that's what, this is a reminder I need and you need in these times. I, I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal instills in us a sense of confidence and strength in our faith. I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal makes of, us, of those who turn back to Allah in times of trial and understand that this is a price we must pay to hold on to our Iman. I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal makes us of those who truly make sincere efforts to bring more light to Islam, to bring more light to the word of Allah in this society. Because Wallahi Al-Azim, at this time when they say Islam is the problem, the Ummah knows very well Quran, Islam is the only solution. It's the only good thing. And Allah has charged us with that responsibility. May Allah make us true ambassadors of this faith. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Quran al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayat wa dhikr al-Hakim.